All right, I have with me Dr. Haley Schaff. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. We already were chatting a bunch off the air and I'm <laughs> excited to record some of our conversation. Me too. I know. I wish we had recorded some of that because it definitely <laughs> would have been what people need to hear. <laughs> but totally. It was fun. And, and a little ranty too. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what the show is We need that. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So I know that you have a history of, um, of your own health struggles and hormone imbalances, and that's why you have dedicated your practice to working with people, helping their hormones and find optimal health. And so why don't you share a little bit about your story? Yeah. So when I was, oh God, when was this? Freshman year of college, I had started to get real bad acne, like to the point where it just, I felt like it was never going away, which I never really had experienced it horribly, but you know, in high school, I would get like one huge cyst, but the rest of my face would be clear. Like it never was all over my face, but when I went to college, my lifestyle definitely got a little bit worse. You know, I wasn't sleeping. I was drinking more. I wasn't eating as great. Uh, you know, surprise, my acne kind of flare. So it gets so bad to the point where my dermatologist is like, you know, why don't you go to your OB she'll put you on birth control and I bet I'll never see you again. And I was like, that sounds pretty good. I didn't know anything else. And I was so sick of like the topicals that she was giving me. Like, I just wanted it to go away. I didn't want it to come up and then keep masking it. So I went to my OB and she was just like, Oh, this is a great one for birth. This is a great one for, excuse me, acne. And you know, it's going to be great. And I was like, what does that even mean that it's good for acne? Like, what is it actually helping? And she's like, well, we just see a lot of people with acne go away with it. And I was like, it's not really a sufficient enough answer, but sure. You know, again, I was still just happy that my acne was going to be going away. And then, um, fast forward, my acne was literally worse than it's ever been. And then she's like, Oh, you know what? We'll put you on a better one. And I'm like, I still don't know what that means, but okay. (laughs) So anyways, and then fast forward a year, how long was I on it? Two years. Yeah. Fast forward two years. I'm in chiropractic school and we're learning about how horrible birth control can be. And, you know, we're learning about various metabolic pathways, nutrient deficiencies, and, you know, the gut brain connection, how birth control ruins your gut. And I start really kind of going down this rabbit hole of, wow, I really don't think that this birth control is serving me. My acne had kind of started to come back in chiropractic school because of stress. And I'm like, it's not even doing what I wanted it to do in the first place. And it's creating all these issues in me. So then I had kind of like transitioned to my own journey of coming off and that's kind of been my, like my journey. And now something that I help other people with, because it's something that's not talked enough about, but more people want that alternative information. They don't want to just rely on a pill for whatever it is, you know, PCOS, endometriosis, acne, you know, missing periods, painful periods. Like those are just all, that's all just a bandaid covering up what's actually going on in the first place. Yeah. That's, um, I have never talked about this before because it's something that I don't really think about very much, but I literally have that same exact story that I, yes, that my acne started to get worse in college. And I attributed it to the fact that I was, you know, drinking a lot and eating really poorly. Um, I remember there being a lot of vegetable oils (laughs) in like, Um, yes. Yeah. Like at the omelet station or something in like the college cafeteria, they like swirl. It's so so funny that you say that because like my fiance and I, we were big into like no vegetable oil. That's like Mm -hmm. our thing. And he's so into it. And we were talking the other day and I was like, think about how much vegetable oil we consumed in the dining hall. And he's like, Oh my God. Like we literally were thinking about that. So yeah. That's so funny. (laughs) Yeah. So I got really bad acne and then I went on birth control and I remember I went on birth control and my acne got worse. And Mm -hmm. I just, I literally like, I have a whole podcast episode with my story and this is not in it because I just kind of forgot about this. And so I did go on birth control and it gave me the worst symptoms. Supposedly they said it kind of like mimics what would happen if you were to get pregnant, like those, that type of hormonal, like those issues. I gained so much weight in my face. My breasts like grew a Mm -hmm. whole cup size or two. It was, I was so bloated. I had the Mm -hmm. worst skin. I got, um, it gave me like yeast infections. I got morning sickness. I was like, this is the worst thing 
ever. And then I ended up getting a lump in my, in my breast. I got a fibroadenoma Mm -hmm. a little while later. And it was just like, this is the worst thing ever. So I came off of it and they kept putting me on different ones. They're like, Oh, try this one instead. Try Yaz, try Yaz low. And like, then I see all these commercials. Like if you were on this birth control pill, you could be entitled to whatever. I'm like, I'm entitled to whatever they're giving away. Seriously. It was terrible. Well, it's, and, and like the other issue I have with birth control is there's little to no informed consent. We yes. have no idea, or at least I was not told the risks and or benefits of treatment. I was not told the nutrient deficiencies it would cause. Mm-hmm. I was not told the possible risk for stroke or like ischemic reactions in the body. Like I was never told any of that, but they are a lot more common than we think. Like just being in practice, I haven't personally seen any, but I know other doctors that um, I've worked with who they have patients who have had like blood clots in their arms, clots in their legs. One person had an embolism that went to their brain. Like it's way more common than we think. Wow. And like, we are just, we should all be sitting here being like, we're very lucky it's not us, but it's, it's a lot more common than we think. Right. And even if you don't get those massive, very yeah. unfortunate side effects, there are so, so, so many side effects. And we're not told that. And no. I told you a little bit off the air that when I was getting my PCOS diagnosis, my doctor shoved a piece of paper in my face and was like, here's a prescription for birth control. You have to take it. There's no cure for PCOS. And I was like, dude, I had really bad reactions to the pill. I'm not Mm -hmm. taking that again. I know it's just going to mask the symptoms. It's not helping at all with the root cause. It doesn't. Right. It's just complete band-aid. And for most of them, they're these like synthetic hormones and that's got to have a lot of side effects on its own. So. Yeah. I mean, cause it's suppressing your own. So like you had mentioned, it's kind of like your body going into like what pregnancy would be like hormonally wise, it's kind of putting your body hormonally into what menopause would look like. Cause your body's just not making hormones. Wow. So like you get kind of like the pregnancy symptoms, like you were saying, but it's like, your body is making nothing. Wow. So when you come off, like you still have those underlying issues there. And because it's not something that people should be on forever. Right. Um, especially like once you're in menopause, like it, or you don't want to have kids anymore. Like there's other ways that you can, if you don't want to have a kid that you can make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, if that's why you're on the pill, you know, totally. I totally, I think that having that accessibility for people who want that is their right and it's what we should do but we also need to be told risks and benefits 100 percent. absolutely so you know if you do take the pill if it's working for you you know really look into those potential nutrient defi- well definite nutrient deficiencies yeah. that are going to happen because of it do you know any can you rattle some off off the top of your head So some big ones are going to be magnesium, which you need for over 300 different reactions in the body, metabolism, glucose uh, management in the cell, like all those things, Mm -hmm. stress management, anxiety, uh, all the B vitamins, same thing, like with anxiety and stress management, like those are so heavily depleted. Zinc, which is good for acne, immune system. I mean, those are like the huge ones. And plus birth control creates low level... uh, like leaky gut. So it's going to create hyperpermeability in the gut, which is not good because 80% of your immune system lives there. Yeah. No wonder why my acne got bad because it worsened my gut um, integrity and it depleted me of zinc, which is Mm -hmm. highly important for acne. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that's insane. Um, insane. Yeah. What helped me get rid of my acne and I haven't done a full episode on acne yet, but I would love to, um, was, getting rid of those blood sugar swings, which Mm -hmm. I always thought that my acne was more, um, it was more hormonal, meaning it would get worse at certain times in my cycle, which it would, but then I was Mm -hmm. having it all the time. And, you know, with PCOS, it was all the time, my whole forehead, I was like, thank goodness I have bangs and I can cover these this forehead up. Cause the whole thing, I'm like, I'm 27. Like, why do, why is my acne so bad right now? I thought it was supposed to end when I was, you know, 10 years ago right. and it was just getting worse and worse, um, at different times. So it got really bad in college and then it kind of got better. And then it got worse again, as I had this like insulin resistant PCOS yeah. and by getting rid of those high and low blood sugar swings, all of a sudden I just never had acne again. You know, I'll get the random pimple here or there, you know, yeah. sensitivity, but like, I don't have acne anymore. Yeah. 
right? Exactly. And like, as I'm sitting here preaching, like I have a very small, like baby one right there, but like you said, like it, it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. And like, I'm sure, you know, it's when you can like get rid of that root cause, which I think when I came off the pill, I think mine was so bad was because of insulin resistance Mm -hmm. and constant blood sugar swings. And, and that was a huge protocol that I put myself on, not even really knowing I'm like, you know, I'm just going to try a little bit lower carb diet. I'm going to try like less flours and less breads and stuff and Mm -hmm. just see how I feel. And like, it definitely did help. That's so, I mean, and it's like intuitively, I kind of knew like what my body wanted. It was very weird. Very, very, uh, I don't know, smart of myself, I guess. That's great. (laughs) So you came off the birth control pill, you still were left with hormonal imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. And so would you call that like post birth control syndrome? Yeah. So that's a huge thing. Post birth control syndrome is a total like new popular thing that when you come off birth control, you can get a whole slew of different things. Like even if you didn't have hormonal imbalances before you might have them when you come off the pill, especially depending how long you were on it for, because think about it, those chronic, you know, some some women are on it for like 10, 15 years. And like, that's 10, 15 years of nutrient deficiencies, 10, 15 years of gut dysfunction, which that's where your hormones all start. So, you know, people can come off, they can have um, issues with weight gain or like weight loss, weight fluctuation, low thyroid, hypothyroid is a big reason or a big like thing that you can experience after birth control because of all these nutrient deficiencies, especially selenium, which is a, a nutrient I forgot to mention. Um, acne because you're going to have an androgen rebound potential you can have an androgen rebound or like when your body starts to make hormones again they're going to kind of be going crazy you know it's like that whole teenager stage again where it's like okay we can finally make hormones again and you just like all over the place wow so that's super common too um but i mean it's a thing it's not a thing that you know your md or like typical family doctor might know what that is but in the functional and more integrative space, I mean, we're seeing it all the time. Yeah, totally. And so you work with women all the time who are experiencing hormonal issues, maybe some Mm -hmm. post pill issues. And so where would someone start if they are like, I want to come off the pill or I have come off the pill and my hormones are crazy, or I just, you know, I know that my hormones are imbalanced and like, where do I go? So great question. And so I want to share three books that I recommend everybody read because one, like working with a practitioner is so great. And I'll give you guys some good tips that I used personally, but I found so much empowerment and learning more about my cycle. Whereas I feel like as women, we just go to RB as long or OBGYN, as long as everything's checked out, we're good to go. And we just kind of go about our life. And we don't, as women know a ton of what's going on in our body, but our body is incredible. Like yeah. literally incredible. I mean, the things that we are able to do and like how our body is able to heal. I mean, it is, I, I think it's so empowering knowing like what ovulation looks like and how to like really harness the power of your cycle and like how to not turn it into a negative thing. And it's like, it's not, I mean, it's an, ama- it's an amazing thing that gives us an amazing ability of tons of things. So reading these books, like were very empowering for me personally. So one is beyond the pill by Dr. Jolene Brighton. Mm-hmm. Number two is a new one by Nicole Jardin, uh, fix your period. Very good one, whether you're coming off birth control or not. Um, and then the other one was the period repair manual. All um, right. I'll add those in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Those, those are one like some of my top resources for sending people to just so they can learn more about their cycle, learn that they don't have to experience pain cramping, like any of that stuff and just like bring the power back to you. Um, but so I definitely recommend those. There's also lots of good podcasts. Like all I'm doing is just listening to free information because you can get a ton of great stuff. So if you're listening here, that's already a great start. Um, let's see some things that I did. I cut out inflammatory foods. So like really cutting out foods that could be causing underlying inflammation are going to be a huge thing. So I kind of did like a mini elimination diet. I was still eating eggs, but I cut out gluten and dairy um, and what else? Wheat. Vegetable oils. Vegetable oils. Oh yeah, that was a big one. Soy? For sure. Yeah, I don't eat, I didn't eat any soy, so that was cut out. Um, But then, you know, see how you feel. And then those aren't things you have to cut out necessarily forever, but they're not serving you. There's not really a point. So I ended up did adding uh, 
raw dairy, like a raw grass fed dairy back in. I don't do a ton of, but if I do want dairy, that's what I'll do. And I tolerate it fine. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it totally, it like helps you listen to your body. So then I was kind of following more of like a higher fat, low carb approach just because I was trying to mitigate any possible insulin and like blood sugar swings, which is a huge place to start when you're trying to heal your hormones. Cause there's, so like, if you think of like your hormones, I'm drawing like a reverse pyramid, but um, insulin and cortisol are at like the top of that reverse pyramid. So if those are off, it's going to literally throw everything else off. So although I was in chiropractic school and I was taking boards and I was so stressed, I really did make stress management a priority. I wasn't over training, but I also wasn't under training. I was like finding whatever that sweet spot was for me, mm -hmm. resting, meditating, deep breathing. Like those were really my top priority. And if like you think about it, that's a lot of free medicine that you can do for yourself is meditating, deep breathing, cutting inflammatory foods out. It's not like I was going to the store and buying like hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of like supplements and herbs. Like I just was cutting out what wasn't serving me and adding in like lots of healthy fats, lots of high quality protein sources, lots of vegetables. I mean, and I, and I felt really good. And honestly, like that's kind of how I eat now, just because that's what I truly feel like that really serves my body and serves my hormones. Yeah. Helping you feel the best. So dialing in a, hor uh, like an eating protocol and I'm sure it shifts a little bit over time, yeah. right? Depending as on it your... should, as yeah. it should, you know, like we kind of evolved to eat different things throughout the year. So therefore like depending on what's in season or what I can get, like my diet will shift, but that's good. It's good for your microbiome. It's good for yeah. nutrient, different nutrient profiles. So, but yeah, overall, totally. Um, that was a huge part of my journey. Right. So, so, so far we have in terms of healthy hormones, we have eating the right foods, cutting out those anti-inflammatory foods, potential food sensitivities. So it's easiest to start with things like gluten, dairy, soy, because, and even sometimes eggs, just because those are really commonly not tolerated by most yeah. people. So those are really good go-tos to be the first thing to cut out of your diet. Um, grains are notoriously the hardest food group to digest. They have the most anti-nutrients. They cause the most issues with your gut. And they're also the least nutrient dense of all the mm -hmm. food categories. So you're not missing anything when you cut out grains. So no. a lot of people find that their whole world changes when they cut those out. And before I like went paleo back in 2012 or whatever it was, I didn't even know what a grain was. So I'm just going to mention it here just because some people yeah. are like, what's a grain, you know, like, because right. we're so used to eating, like at that time, I was so used to eating processed food that I didn't know what was a grain versus like, I know, I knew what fruits and vegetables were <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and like meat, right. but you know, grains are wheat, barley, rye, rice, oats, corn. Um, and then there's some smaller ones like Kamut and spelt and whatever, mm -hmm. but they are not all of them contain gluten, but many of them do. Things like rice, quinoa, corn, those don't contain gluten. Oats usually have um, shared equipment with gluten, so that's why you need to look for gluten free oats if you're doing gluten free but not grain free. And um, and then most of the other ones do contain gluten, which is a protein which is not digested by humans. It's very difficult for us, our systems to digest and break down and it causes the release of zonulin, which opens up the gut lining. So it's just a really not a good <laughs> thing to include in your diet. And it would be a great thing to start with if that's mm -hmm. where you're at. If you're already have that out, good for you, you know? Yeah. And then we talked about stress management. So that is something that I love how you wrote on your Instagram. It's not selfish. It's essential. Yeah. So, yeah. We always think it's like taking care of ourselves is like, oh, I don't have time for it because whether you're a caregiver to somebody else or, you know, like you just are super busy, we, th we, we always feel bad about taking time for ourselves, but like, that's a non-negotiable for me. My morning, I like getting up in the morning before anybody else, because I like sitting here with my book and my bulletproof coffee and just like being, yeah. and nobody's talking to me. I'm not on my phone. I'm not answering messages. And like, I don't really start my day until I get a walk, a workout, like my time, like to take care of my physical body, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, those are all non-negotiables where people feel like I'm okay saying no to certain things to take care of myself. And I feel like a lot of people aren't. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know. Like I, I totally understand why it's hard for people, but we can't feel bad 
taking time for ourselves because we can't serve others if we aren't fully taken care of, no matter what you do, yeah. you know? I love that. Yeah. And it's a matter of setting these boundaries and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this could be a whole other podcast and, you know, I'm not super qualified, know. you know, I don't have qualifications on this, but you know, when you are coming from a place of self-love and self-respect and all those, you know, self, whatever, compassion, like all those words you are, when you are fostering that, you automatically will start to set these boundaries for yourself, mm -hmm. or you can realize that, you know, oh, my self-love is, you know, needs a little work, but I know that setting boundaries is a form of self-love and self-care. Yeah. And so totally. you set these boundaries, like, I don't look at my phone at this time, or I, you know, I work out no matter what. Like I got that from my mom, actually. She's like, I always put workouts into my schedule because I know I feel best and I work everything else around it. And Same. Like, yeah. And so when I'm trying to add in a new habit, so like I started doing screens off at eight, like that was the one thing that I'm like, okay, this is what I do. I have alarm set. Like this is what I do now. And so I work everything else around it. That means I have mm -hmm. to finish my work earlier. I have to plan mm -hmm. ahead, but then you get it done and you get mm -hmm. it in there. And so these like becoming consistent, you said harnessing the power of consistency, right? On one of your podcast episodes, like I love that, like that consistency that that's what you do. This is your morning routine. And then you're not just doing it two times because you're not going to get benefit from meditating two times in a year. Right? right. And so you're going to be like, Oh, meditation didn't work for me. No, you didn't do it. You just <laughs> right? didn't do it. Right. And yeah. I've been totally guilty of that. To, like I have been, I've been working out for so long where it's like, that's a part of my day. I walk every day with my dog because like, that's, I literally have to, yeah. I eat healthy because it makes me feel good. But meditation is kind of a new thing where I'm like, I was real good about it when quarantine started. And I was like, well, what else am I going to do? And then once like life started picking up for me again, I was like, I'm fine without meditation, but no, I'm not because I'm the most type A person you're going to ever meet. My mind does not shut off until my head hits the pillow. And, and I need to like slow down and take that time. So like, if you're having issues with this, like what my mom and I do is we'll, we send each other the like meditation emoji. Anytime we've meditated to be like, do you meditate today? I send her the emoji, you know, like, and find that self accountability buddy that. or like check it off on your to-do list or whatever. Like if you like are a task oriented person, but like for me, I've been doing it every single day now for over a week. And that's, that's where I feel the best. Like if I do it a few times a week, that's still better than none, mm -hmm. but I do feel good doing it every day. So whatever healthy habit you kind of need to fit in there, that's a good way to, to just keep making it consistent. Yeah. I love that. And I am coming out with a program probably in, sometime this fall, if not this month, but it's going to be focused. It's called beyond the macros and it's going to go all, <laughs> thank you. It's going to be, um, the tagline is health is more than just carbs, fats, and protein. Oh my God. And it is going to be a membership program where I'm going to give you guys either like knowledge that I have in creating a healthy lifestyle and also bring on experts. So, you know, you can come back and give a talk to. on something and we can talk about like how to create a morning routine, how to, you know, and then experiment with different types of meditation, like sitting mm -hmm. down, closing my eyes, breathing doesn't work for me. I'm yeah. not there yet. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it'll work for mm -hmm. me down the road, but I like guided meditation. So like me too. learning different things about like trying on different things for, to make it a routine. Right. So if I, yeah. tr if I'm like, okay, I know I'm supposed to meditate, but I'm just never called to do it. And I never put it in my routine, th then there's no benefit from that. So right. trying on these different things, like maybe a moving meditation, a walking mm -hmm. meditation, maybe, and it's not only going to be meditation, right? Um, yeah, yeah. There's going to be breath work and all different so things cool. in all different areas because we are these whole people. So this is kind of going back to this, these recommendations for your healthy hormones. It's not notice that number one was food right? Mm -hmm. Which is super important, but the rest of them, yeah, it wasn't supplements. Yeah. It's food. And the rest of them, it's not going to be food. You know, it's right. going to be like things like your liver and your lymphatic mm -hmm. system. So we are these whole beings. And when I find that people come into these dead ends in there and say like, Oh, keto didn't work for me. Carnivore didn't work. Paleo didn't work. It's because you're only focusing on your diet. You need a lifestyle plan and going to the gym twice a week is not uh, like enough to constitute a healthy 
lifestyle, right? So yeah. we need this healthy diet and lifestyle, but it seems like elusive and then we're not making routines and we have trouble doing it. We don't know what's out there, you know, maybe, I don't know. So that's, no, <laughs> that's no, part I of love the program. That. So. And it's so important because that was one thing that I definitely felt like a few years ago when I was kind of more in just like the fitness space before I was, yeah. you know, into this whole space, I like macros were totally the thing. Like if someone came to you for weight loss, like you, you gave them the macros and it's kind of out your, the door and there's still a lot of people who like it, it like our body's not a calculator. Our body, <laughs> our body can calculator. be a calculator if like our body can be a calculator when it's everything else is functioning properly. Like most people are not functioning yeah. totally properly. When we have 88% of the population is not metabolically active or metabolically fit, they need a little bit more help than just protein, carb, and fat. Boom. See you later. Check in with me in a month. That's, right. we need better than that. And so the, that's why, oops, that's why I'm so glad that you're doing something like that because that's, that's what people really need is it's a holistic approach. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. And that's where that word comes from. We hear it so often and we're like, oh, holistic just means like, you know, like earthy, hippy crunchy, dippy, like, and yeah. weird and crunchy, like, right? Yeah, it's like no. It means like looking at the whole person. Like, how is your sleep? Are like, what is your how, like home environment like? Mm -hmm. Like, where where's your stress at? What is your self care like? You know, like what are you doing to help your liver? Like, mm -hmm. are you you know practicing fasting? And where is your yeah. you know spirituality or just your connection with yourself and nature? And you know, so it's. Yep. It's going to be really exciting. So let's get back into this list. So we have food, we have stress management, and let's talk about loving your liver. So liver is really important Ooh, okay. for hormone balance, right? Yeah. So, so many different things. So when we think of liver, most people think, okay, yeah, my liver, it works because it will, you can cut it out and it'll grow back. Most people's livers are working, but like they're working in over drive because we are constantly burdening it with our toxic lifestyle, toxic air, toxic products, toxic thoughts mm -hmm. over, you know, too many hormones and like it's working, but we're just not like we're, we're continuing to load in the toxic bucket, which is not helping really. <laughs> it's yeah. making things worse. And a lot of people could use a little bit of support for their liver. So their liver went like one of the best ways to do it, which is something I've been getting into more as of recently is mm -hmm actually eating liver. And if you don't Yay. like liver, you can do desiccated liver, but like, oh my God, I've literally never felt more nourished in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Like wants, like your liver yeah. wants, you know? So anyways, that's some people in your audience might be like, oh my God. Yeah. But some people like, cause I'm just starting to talk about people are like, what you're actually eating that. And I was like, yep. I yeah. Am. So, um, I, I'm not sure if I've talked about it on the podcast, but I have a highlight on my Instagram of how I actually consume liver because I hate the taste and I don't want to taste it at all. Yeah. So what I do is I buy it frozen grass fed liver. You can find it in whole foods and cool. then you thaw it and then cut it up into tiny pieces mm -hmm. and then you freeze it. And I put them on like parchment paper in a big glass container and I stick it in the freezer. And whenever I want to take some, I just take out like, you know, five, six, seven of them. And then I just swallow them with water. And oh sometimes, mm -hmm. so you take like a liver pill and you don't what? have to taste them. And oh you God, just, I'm so going to do that. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll just do like a little bit of potential like HCL support when I'm doing that. Cause I'm drinking a lot of water and I'm not chewing it, but right, right, the right. liver is so soft that that stuff yeah, is going to, it's, it's not dissolve. like steak meat. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God. That's so smart. But I mean, that's, that's something that's totally been helping my liver and the pill mm -hmm. for the record torched my liver, like the wow. small baby pill that we take every day. Cause I got, I started getting melasma and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well that's totally because there's, there's like clearance and there's not enough clearance. And so then I started going to acupuncture, which was a huge part of my journey that I didn't mention, but I love Eastern medicine. It's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm such a believer in, and I, they take a holistic approach, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, I had a little bit of liver cheese stagnation. So there was like, things just weren't moving as much as they should. So other things that I like, you know, you can get lymphatic uh, to help your lymphatic drainage and help your liver. So things like castor oil packs are phenomenal. Movement, going out for a walk, going for a workout, doing some yoga. Those are all great. Epsom salt baths, phenomenal um, for like more passive, like more self-care liver help. Mm -hmm. um, cutting out 
like toxic things like cleaning out my personal care products and cleaning out like things that we do our laundry with and like things that are in our house. Like as, I wanted to make it as non-toxic as possible because if I'm trying to heal and I'm doing everything I possibly can, but I'm still using like fragrance and crap on our laundry and toxic personal care products, like that's, that's kind of negating whatever progress I might be making. Yeah. Um, so those are like some of my absolute favorite ways that I just like to do it on a, a daily basis. And there's obviously foods you can consume like like liver or dandelion or milk broccoli thistle. Sprouts. Yeah, broccoli mm -hmm. sprouts. Like there's so many different food groups that you can add in to just help support yourself. Right. And one of the things that I think is most fascinating, and if you just Google a picture of like liver phase one, phase two detoxification, or if you just write liver detoxification, it should come up. If you look at all the processes that the liver has to go through in all of these, like to, in order to detoxify our bodies, what it needs are tons of nutrients. So tons. it's, it's crazy. So having liver, it is the most nutrient dense food. So hence why it helps your liver to detoxify because it gives it the necessary nutrients to actually do its job. So I love that approach because you're just supporting your body's ability to do it on its own because our bodies yep. know how to do stuff. We just need to get out of their way and then give yep. them the tools to be able to do it optimally, right? So yeah. thinking about what does your liver need? Your liver needs nutrients and it doesn't want toxins. So yeah. I talk about ewg.org on every single mm -hmm. podcast episode, I think. Um, you know, I'm a beauty counter like consultant because I love their products because they're toxin yeah. free. It's just so easy to find. And I'm a makeup snob. So it's easy to find. <laughs> I know like, your makeup looks great. I'm like, sorry, I'm not wearing any. <laughs> it's okay. It's fine. I'm just, I wear this all the time. I just like makeup, <laughs> but like, no, I I love it. And I, yeah. I didn't wear makeup as much, but then I, I started getting into beauty counter as well. And I do love it. I love makeup's more fun when it's not bad for you. Right. You don't have to feel you know? bad about putting it on your face yeah. every day. And so we always start, I always recommend to kind of start with things that are going on your skin as mm -hmm. like the first line of things that you want to change. So I've talked about this in other episodes, but you know, you don't have to go to the store and buy new of every single thing you own. Like nope. start with one category, the category of like things that seep into my skin, like lotion and foundation and blush and things like that. And then laundry detergent is another important one because the clothes are on you all day. Right. right? So that's another one of those. And then just slowly start switching them out. Like look up your products in ewg.org and find some alternatives and you can find healthy alternatives there. Things that we spray our house with. I mean, people are using like these really toxic things because of COVID and you can really just use um, hydrogen peroxide in a spray bottle. Yeah. So it's amazing. It, you know, it breaks down to be water and oxygen. So that's it's a, a great tip. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah, I clean my office with that at work <laughs> they know that like they don't put Lysol bottles in there for me. And I'm like, thank yep. you. Appreciate thank that. <laughs> yeah. Don't want yeah. to be breathing that in. Exactly. So we talked about loving our liver and now let's talk about the lymphatic system because that's not something I've ever yes. brought up before. And I'm sure yeah. some people don't even know what that is. We have one of those. <laughs> yeah. So the lymphatic system is essentially a huge part of your immune system. It's how fluid is moving throughout the body. And so unlike our circulatory system, the lymphatic system, it doesn't have valves. Like it's not, it's, it's, it it's not going right? to move automatically. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to move it. So whether mm -hmm. we move it manually through manual therapy or we move it through movement and like that, I mean, you actually can even move it through certain foods and herbs and stuff like that too, but it's really important to get things moving because if there's any type of like swelling in an area or like skin condition or, you know, cankles or like pitting yeah. a, like edema in that type of sense or lymphedema, you know, like yeah. there's, stagnation of fluid it's just going to get there and there's not, like you need to keep things moving for your yeah. immune system healthy digestion healthy hormones because the hormones are just like in a place and they're not going anywhere that's not beneficial so um the lymphatic system is is a huge part so like part of my morning routine is while the coffee's brewing and after i've had like a, a yeti fill of like water, lemon, apple cider vinegar, I'll do like a little lymphatic massage or I like, I love doing facial gua sha in the morning too. Like any way that ooh, I can just like get my lymph moving. So, um, there's this good video I saw, like you kind of start at your face and you kind of go down your face and you're just like kind of working on these little points where the lymph, 
uh, kind of resides like these main lymph nodes and getting those going, but you can really feel it. Like I can start to feel like my stomach gurgle, like digestion is kind of kicking back in. Belly breathing is a really great way to get all of like your GI lymph going because there's wow. so many lymph nodes there, like tons and tons of lymph nodes. So, I mean, dry brushing is another great way. I don't know if you've done that, but that's, that's awesome. one of my favorite ways to detox too. Yeah. And the only other one that um, I've heard of that you didn't mention was rebounding or like jumping Oh yeah, can help. And then yep. um, they taught us in school, like for your breast tissue, there was like a really funny lecture that we had where it was called like fluff your girls. And you're supposed to like literally take your breasts and just like move them around and like shake the lymph so yep. it can start moving. And even if you have breast tenderness, like, you know, right before your cycle, That's do this. That's stagnation. Yeah. Do that and watch the breast t- like tenderness like go down so much. It's so crazy. So crazy. Yeah. Like, and it's, and that's so important. Cause like then the breast, and then you've got your axillary lymph nodes, which like, if you're not using clean deodorant, like you're yep, hindering those lymph nodes. So, I mean, there's just, there's so many different things, but like, I don't, I used to get a lot of breast tenderness before my period. And now I don't, I don't, I can't remember the last time that I had it. Yeah. Um, same here. So some like really easy, free things that you can do daily, you know, more like advanced ways that you can support lymphatic drainage are things like infrared sauna, which I love and swear by, um, massage therapy, cupping therapy, acupuncture. Like those are also really great ways that you can like go to a professional and they can help you move your lymph. You can go to a lymphatic massage specialist. There's, there's some of those, but, um, I mean, there's tons and tons of ways. That's great. Maybe we'll have to get you on the Beyond the Macros program talking about uh, lymphatic stuff and you can show oh, us I the love that. lymphatic massage and the dry brushing and that would be a really yeah. fun topic. So because people I'm sure are like, I don't really know, maybe some people know what it is, but some people would be intrigued to start adding some of those things to their routine. So for sure. And, and it's like, yeah. it's so easy. It just fits into your routine and it's a little bit of self-care because it's like palliative, like you're you're mm-hmm. massaging yourself or you're like dry brushing is great because your skin feels smooth. So it's like, it's a win-win in so many different aspects. Totally. Love that. So the last one on the list is exercise. And we kind of already mm-hmm. talked about how important movement is for balancing blood sugar, for mm-hmm. your lymphatic system. And let's also talk about the benefits of having muscles. And I think a lot of women are very, like, they're so afraid to pick up a weight. They're like, I don't want to bulk up. It's like, honey, you have to work so hard to bulk up, like so hard. You're not going to try. You're not going to bulk. (laughs) You're not, (laughs) you're not going to bulk. No. No. And it's, I, I can't believe that like in this day and age that we're still afraid of of that. But I mean, muscle has so many benefits. Muscle, I mean, it's an endocrine organ. It's, Mm -hmm. if you want to support your hormones, like support your muscle tissue, because like I said, it's an endocrine organ. It's secreting and making its own hormones. It's going to help so much with fat loss, which is a huge buzzword. And people, obviously a lot of people want more help with that. And the best way to do that is lean muscle mass tissue, because it's going to increase your metabolic rate. I mean, so many different muscle like is just incredible. And there's a really great practitioner, um, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. She focuses on muscle centric medicine. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's, Mm -hmm. she's amazing. So I, she's got a lot of great knowledge out there on that. Um, but it's, if you aren't weight training, it's a huge, huge pillar of your health that you might not be optimizing as much as you could be. Yeah, totally. Um, and even just building muscle helps your insulin sensitivity. And we, even after being sedentary for like a week, we see our muscles start to become insulin resistant. Muscles are some of the first tissue to become insulin resistant. So we can reverse that by using them. And in the book, how we get sick by Ben Bickman, have you read it yet? Um, no, but that's on my list. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. You're going to love it. So in that book, he talks about how you can literally tell which muscles have not been worked recently by the, their level of insulin resistance. So So it's so crazy. So it's important to get like, you know, a full body workout and even just doing, starting with body weight episode uh, episodes. Um, I'm thinking my program that I'm like, I'm going to have body weight episodes. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I'm going to have these exercise. Um, so yeah, these body weight exercises and, you know, full body workouts. Like if your body is, you know, start where you're at, that's really important, but also the 
the intensity of the exercise is really, that's what's really going to help to build muscle and improve insulin sensitivity. So mm -hmm. if you're very new to working out, just doing anything at all is perfect. That's exactly yep. where you want to be. The best exercise yep. is that what you do, but yep. as much as you can start to increase the intensity lift until you're fatigued, like until you can't do another rep. And then you're getting the biggest bang for your buck because you're building muscle tissue and you're improving your insulin sensitivity, improving your hormone balance overall. So super important yeah. stuff and super important. And yeah. I mean, it's, and it's so good for longevity and yes bone health. I mean, especially as you age, which like, that's not necessarily the type of demographic that I help, but like, it's, it's so, so important. I mean, right. when people get into menopause and everything, I mean, maintaining your muscle mass, like there's been so many different studies with more muscle mass correlating to higher survival with whatever chronic disease is thrown at them, whether it's cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, like the, those that have more muscle tissue are just more resilient. And if you think about it, I feel like I think I talked about this in one of my podcast episodes, but like muscle looks appealing to us, but I think that it looks appealing to us because on like an evolutionary standpoint, muscle meant that one, they're more resilient, they're stronger, they're going to be able to fight off what comes Two, like it's showing that internally things are just going to be healthier. They're going to be more sensitive to insulin and they're not going to be as prone to chronic disease because all their other things are working. Like, like I don't know if that's me, just me being crazy, but I think that that's why that that look is just attractive is because of all the underlying health things that it shows. I completely agree with that. And that's why, I mean, men are whatever, more attracted to women who have wider hips and stuff because it's better for birthing babies. So they come these like desires and, you know, what we find to be good looking or whatever, they do have this evolutionary background, I think. And a lot of it has to do with health. So mm -hmm. what does this optimal health look like? And, you know, if you're not, if you're not moving, your body's not going to be working properly. And even if you're just starting with going for walks, like I said, like start where you're at, the best exercise is the one that you actually do. <laughs> so, yes. you know, if yes. you do a walk, just end it with like, five jumping jacks or five squats yeah. if your knees can, if your mobility can handle it, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like it's all about meeting yourself where you're at and just being consistent with it. Like finding a routine that you're consistent with and find something that like helps you relieve your stress, makes you feel good about yourself. And also like, as you get into it, we'll challenge you a little bit. So if you're going for a walk, like, you know, take that extra loop or try to go up, you know, change elevation. Like once you're starting to kind of get get in the habit, like just kind of find new ways to push yourself and challenge yourself. I love that. And also don't feel bad about yourself for not doing these things, like, or yeah. doing that whole, like comparing mind. We've been at this for years, right? I don't want to speak for years. you, but yeah, years. Like almost like years, probably like 10 years. I started lifting when I was like more than 10 years. I was probably like 14, 13 Wow. But yeah. A while. Yeah. So, and, so, and even just like a health journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it takes so much time, like, especially with hormone healing, like, I mean, anything, don't feel discouraged along your journey because it's, it's so much more worth it to just like trust the process and stick it out than it would be to give up because that like, what would that solve? That wouldn't solve anything, right. you know, no matter what the goal is. So I think that's important. Yeah. And like trust the process. I love that, but also be thinking outside the box. So uh -huh. not just like I'm, I did keto and now I go to the gym. Remember all these other factors that we talked about, you know, what are you thinking about yourself every day when you look in the mirror? Do you believe that you can get healthy? Like, do you believe that you're going to, your hormones are going to be balanced or are you constantly thinking I have hormone imbalance? I have PCOS. My handle is PCOS girl X, Y, Z, like diabetes, something like are you identifying with your disease? Is that who you are? Or is it this constant talk of like, I'm working to reverse this. Like I'm reversing it. Like I'm doing it, you know? I love that. Yeah. That how we are framing things is so, so, so important and just, it can't be overlooked. So. Right. Because like you think about it when you meet somebody and like sometimes like when you, someone is classifying whatever is going on with them is who they are. It's like, okay, my name is so-and-so and I have diabetes or my name is so-and-so and I have PCOS. It's like when they're meeting you, mm -hmm. it's like immediately coming off. I mean, not like in person, but you know what I mean? Like they're, that's just who they are. That's who they, but it's, it's not who they are. It's a, it's a part of what they're going through, but it does not define them. Whatever that is, 
is because I see that so often where it's like, oh, my name's whatever. And like, my biggest struggle is I'm hypothyroid or I have have Hashimoto's or I have, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or put the diagnosis in wherever, whatever you're healing from. But like, I mean, don't discount that you have that and work towards it, but it's not who you are. Right. Yeah. And I, I like that idea of not identifying with it. And just like how I talk about like not identifying with your diet. That's why this is not called yes. the keto show, whatever, because I don't eat, I'm not in ketosis every second of every day. No, I, and I don't think you really, I, I think it's good to be metabolically flexible, you know? Totally. And I don't think that everyone should be in ketosis all the time. I think it should be somewhat cyclical. I think it should be depending on the time of the year. I think it's something that you should come in and out of some of the time. Um, But of course it needs to be personalized to you. So whatever that individual journey looks like, you know, like I can, I ate something the other day. What did I have for, I had a CGM on and I ate like a bunch of rice or something at night. And I had like an apple as an experiment. The next morning I woke up and I didn't feel like having breakfast. And at one o'clock I tested my ketones it was 0.8. I was back in ketosis. So yeah. So like the cool thing about like, I don't identify with that because that's not who I am at every second of every day. I mean, it's easy to, it's easier to explain. I understand it. So I'm mostly keto, whatever, you know, Yeah. it's not like, don't ever say that, but like, you know, I eat mostly this way, not I am this, you know, like I even said it then, like we have that tendency to just like identify and then we get these blinders on that we can't see beyond it's like well i'm keto and i'm doing keto and so i'm trusting that keto is right for me and i'm just going to keep doing it even if things aren't working and so that's where you run into problems so yeah i i totally love that because people are always like what type of diet do you eat are you carnivore are you are you paleo and i was like i i don't i don't like to associate myself with one diet like today my breakfast was carnivore, but my dinner is going to be more keto. And then I, a lot of times just eat like seasonal paleo, but like, if I don't, I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot. Like I just, you know, it's, we put so much pressure on ourselves. Like I like to fast every day, but if I can't fast for my normal window, cause something's going on, like my life isn't over. It's fine. You know, like I just, it's all about that lifestyle. And I, I love that you made that point. And that's also so people need to be as metabolically healthy as you to be able to eat rice and an apple and then to be in ketosis like the next day. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it didn't happen so well with the acai bowl that I ate. Oh Oh my goodness. So I had a bigger acai bowl than I normally do. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was so big, but, um, I, it made my blood sugar go from like 80 to 147. In and it stayed, my blood sugar didn't come down to baseline for eight hours. Oh my God. Eight. So, you know, perhaps Whoa. my body can handle whatever, you know, the car, the rice and the apple, but it did not handle whatever Whoa. was happening in that acai bowl. So that was insane. It was wow. like wild. How so, do you like to test your ketones via blood? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I think ketones, cool. uh, yeah, ketones are my favorite way. Um, with, with blood is the best way to test ketones. Yeah. I don't find the urine strips are super accurate. Like, I'll fast and I won't have really had any car. Like, I know that I'm in ketosis because, like, I just know. And I, like, will use a urine strip and I'm like, this is wrong. <laughs> right. So, the reason why the urine strips stop working is that what happens is, is that your body, in, with the urine scri- strips are measuring the excreted non-used, um, I believe it's the acetoacetate. And so when we're excreting it, we're not, that means we're not using it. And so right. as your body gets more metabolically flexible and you become a better fat burner, you're going to be using more of the ketones. So you're not going to be excreting it on the strip. So this is what I see happen to people all the time, it happened to me too, is that when I first started keto, all I had were the the urine strips. Mm -hmm. And at first they were starting to get darker and darker and darker. And because I was, you know, making more and more ketones, but as my body got better at using them, then the strips started to get lighter and lighter and lighter. And I was like, oh no, I'm not in ketosis anymore. I need to do this harder. And meanwhile, my body was just getting better at using the ketones. So I don't recommend the urine strips at all. Yeah. I don't like them. Yeah. And even the breath is like, eh, I don't love that. But, um, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is what the ketone that's tested when we test the blood, that's definitely 
the most accurate I have found. And I've heard a lot of like big keto people um, also agreeing with that. So yeah. Um, yeah, there's different meters that you can get on, on Amazon. They're, they're pretty cheap, but the strips are what are expensive. They're about a dollar a strip, no matter which yeah. brand you go with. So testing at the right time is also important. So I like to test like right before dinner when mm-hmm. I have been like fasting since lunch. And that's kind of when you get a good idea or at the end of a fast, like if you're about yeah. to fast, that's a good time as well. So yeah. Cause like at the end of a fast, like you 100% most people, like if you are metabolically flexible, like you should be in ketosis. Totally. Yeah. So, so no, that's so interesting. That's a whole nother topic. Like that's definitely yeah. stuff that is of recently I've been really into, I've seen the huge impact that it can make on health. So fasting, ketosis, and just metabolic flexibility. It's, it's so, so important, especially for hormone health. Totally. Yeah. And you want to be like always aware of, you know, if your body is needing a little bit more carbohydrate or not, depending yep. on certain times in your cycle. And that's yep. why with women, it's not like be keto, always keto forever and ever at the end. Like yeah. it's, you know, you, this openness is so yep. important to be like, Hmm, I'm in like, I'm craving like a lot of carbohydrates today and that never happens to me. So I might, you know, need to listen to it. Like you dial in, yeah. you get used to like what your body's asking you for. And then you can really listen to its, its callings. And it's not like a craving, right? When yeah, exactly. Addicted to processed foods or something. Right. Right. Cause like if you're addicted to processed foods or you have candida overgrowth or you're like a carbaholic, like listening to your cravings is just only going to make your problem worse. But when you have when you are intuitive and you, you know what your body feels good eating, like I think that's super important because then you can give it what it's actually asking for and like give it what will serve you. Yeah. Awesome. So I feel like we could talk forever, but this I, I think would be a good place <laughs> to end it. Um, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and what you teach about? Awesome. So yeah, I'm really active on Instagram. You can find me at Dr. Haley Schaff. That is my Instagram platform. I have a website, uh, drhaleyshop.com. You can find me on my podcast, which I definitely want to have you on at Thank Alpha you. Health and Wellness Radio. We, it's pretty much on any, any place you listen to podcasts, but yeah, yeah. Th- that's kind of where I live. That's kind of where I put the most information and content. And you can see me and my dog who is, she's my logo to my business. She's staring at me as I'm recording this. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, cute. that's where, that's where I am, but I'd love to connect with you guys. And I thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Yeah. So good. I feel like we really could talk about so many more topics and I'm definitely going to have you on my beyond the macros membership site. And I would love that. That'll be super fun. Yeah. We'll go like really in depth about, you know, all sorts of topics there. And that's where it's going to be like, you know, the paid content, you really get like the how to's like how to put this all together. So like we can do some lymphatic massage. We can do some dry brush. Yeah. Washa. We'll just do all the things. Oh, I love it. I'm so excited. <laughs> Me too. I'm, I'm so really excited. making this membership program for myself, just so you know. So I, I know, can, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I want to bring on all these people I want to learn things from. <laughs> so, so cool. It'll be super fun. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and we'll have to have you back on soon. Awesome. Thank okay. you. All right. See you soon. Bye.